You're listening to the Simple Growth Podcast, the show that helps business owners get their life back. Here's your host, Mike Callahan. Welcome back to the SA Weekly Talk Show. Mike Callahan here with co-host Cody Owen and special guest Dylan Rothenberg of uh, originally Sudbury, Ontario, but now of Kingston, Ontario, up in the north. So uh, Dylan and I go way back. He was actually probably the first Simple Growth Automation client. So uh, we've known our, known each other quite a bit and uh, talked some serious business and particularly around snow removal. So the time we're getting into right now um, doesn't really seem like it's ready for snow. But if you're in the north or northeast, uh, right now is probably the time you want to start thinking about snow removal, contract renewal, and marketing if you haven't already. So uh, I'm going to probably suggest you're behind the eight ball already. So we thought it was no better time to bring in the expert of all things snow removal and uh, disruptors, well, uh, of different technologies and equipment that uh, Dylan had been using in his company, Maxim Lawn Care. So, uh, Dylan, if people haven't met you before, if you wouldn't mind just giving a little background on how you got into the uh, lovely world of landscaping and particularly snow removal in uh, Sudbury, Ontario. Yeah, so it's uh, definitely a unique segment to be in for sure, uh, long hours. But basically, I started out with just a landscaping company. We eventually, uh, especially being in Sudbury, where we get uh, 250 plus centimeters uh, a year on average, it was just um, the logical solution to roll into snow removal eventually. Uh, kind of picked off, uh, picked up fairly slowly, but as we started dialing in our services a little bit better, that was the most explosive part of our business. And um, by the end of it, before I had sold my business, actually, that was probably about 60 to 70% of our actual total revenue. Um, so yeah, definitely use some, some pretty unique equipment, uh, at least for our market. It's becoming a little bit more and more popular now with our uh, tractor snowblowers and, and stuff like that. But I'm sure we'll, we'll get into that a little bit deeper. <laughs> Yeah, and that's something that, uh, I'll be honest, I had never really seen uh, until I saw, uh, I believe it was Protex uh, Snow Warriors or something like that. It was uh, a documentary they did. It was a Vanderzine company up out of, um, I believe, Quebec, Canada. And they had kind of revolutionized uh, the way they plowed snow up there. And they get so much freaking snow that you can't plow it because the mountains of snow literally are 12 to 15 feet on each side of the road and the driveway. So they went in and created this inverted... Uh, snow blowing opportunity and a lot of guys like yourself um uh, about the same time jumped onto that uh, now in the states it's probably not that uh well adopted so if you're looking to actually see what this looks like here i'll actually blow up my screen and then we'll get into the content but uh, if you're watching live on the facebook here or uh, listen to the podcast it's worth checking out the live stream here because it's uh very very interesting what this actually looks like here so you can kind of see it uh here's dylan standing in front of a couple of the tractors that he owned uh, in his business, but um, really interesting on in the back of the snowblower. It's just an inverted uh, snowblower that drops down and shoots everything else out. So uh, it allows you to uh, move a lot quicker. And we're going to talk about the benefits and disadvantages of actually a tractor mounted snowblower as well. And if you look in the links uh, of the SA Weekly here on the Facebook Live, um, there is an additional article that Dylan has been uh, featured in in Snow Magazine the three keys to revolutionize your market. So in this article, Dylan was kind enough to break down uh, three of the main things that he did to differentiate himself in that market and pretty much go out and dominate it. So uh, had a little added bonus content um, there. Hey Mike, Before, let's, yeah. drop, let's drop the link to that article again. I think you gave everyone the link to join our broadcast. Uh, yeah, I did, didn't I? <laughs> yeah. I Welcome know. to the show, everyone. Welcome, Welcome to the show. <laughs> All right, there we go. Last time I'm allowed to handle the technology here, so I appreciate that, Cody. All right, so we've got that, and that should be in the notes live here uh, in a few minutes. So we'll see who else is joining the show as a special guest in a few minutes. Um, <laughs> but I guess the first thing, Dylan, I really want to talk about here is uh, marketing. And one of the things that I was really impressed with you right out of the gates when we met was your approach to marketing. So would you mind breaking down how you went on and actually marketed your snow removal services and then did it transition or did it change the type of marketing or the content from when you went to uh, snow plowing with actual trucks to actual um, tractors? Was there, was there a different uh, play on the marketing there? Yeah, so when we first started marketing it pretty heavily, uh, we were just doing the plowing. And the, the thing we kind of found was there was a wide range of what people were charging for a driveway or a lot. Um, commercial lots are going to differ entirely. Yeah, you most likely need to um, do a specialized quote for that. 
but we really wanted to have like simplified upfront pricing for our residential customers and kind of change the conversation where instead of their calling for a quote, they don't really know when you're getting back to them. They had already seen all of our content on our website, on our postcards, door hangers, whatever that might be. And they could already kind of place where they were in the pricing structure. And they were calling us more to maybe ask one or two final questions and then actually sign up for the service instead of a week or a two week long estimate and, and finally getting them to sign up process. So when we were able to, to kind of turn on the, the jets when it came to marketing, we were able to actually accept much more customers rather than have it be a big, big burden on our office. That was kind of the very, very initial starting of it when we were still doing the actual plowing. Um, basically everything had kind of changed. We, we were growing steadily, but nothing really to write home about uh, when it came to the snow plowing. The minute we got the tractor, uh, basically everything had changed. There was actually already another company in our market that was well capitalized, had purchased several uh, very nice brand new tractors before us. We were kind of a little bit late to the jump in our relatively small market. Uh, but the, the service was still so unique and, and so different compared to all the plowing companies that uh, with the right marketing, we were actually able to explode that segment. So we started off with just like the regular uh, Facebook ads, Google ads and stuff like that. Um, and I thought it was interesting to note that uh, our best performing Facebook ad that, that we ever had, we had tried, you know, uh, discounts, catchy little phrases, whatever that might be. We'd even tried radio advertising, stuff like that. But the thing that performed the best, and I found this kind of unique, was literally just a video, about a uh, 30 to 40 second video of a guy doing a driveway with our snowblower. I mean, it kind of makes sense when you think about it, but I found that very unique that we probably had over 100,000 views of that video uh, on Facebook of people just watching a guy do a driveway with this unique technology. Interesting. So, in that, and it kind of, I think that makes sense uh, because a lot of us are kind of engaged in it. If it's new, we want to figure out how, how is it going to work? What's it look like? Um, and as you're kind of looking at that marketing play, Dylan, uh, once people saw that video, what it actually looked like and how it operated, was there certain things based on the regular plowing with a truck versus a tractor? Was there benefits, pros and cons that were highlighted in that marketing concept? Or how did you use the, the ability of that tractor to differentiate yourself from that market? Yeah, so there was, there was definitely a couple main points. You touched on one of them, the fact, especially in Sudbury, you're 100% you're right. Like by the end of the winter, sometimes you'd literally have on regular uh, winters, like six to eight feet of snow banks at the end of your driveway, right? becomes quite a bit of a hazard um, and, and you actually do run out of room sometimes uh, with just a regular truck where you have to back blade and, and push it up into the lawn. So on heavy winters, people would literally have to call like a backhoe or a loader and actually push those banks back in their lawn. With the snowblower, there was no chance of that, right? So you had full visibility all winter and there was never, no matter how uh, intense the winter was, there was never a chance of you having to, to call someone to actually relocate the snow. That was that was a really easy point. Sorry, go ahead, Gordon. Oh, uh, I wanted to ask a question, and this might be like because I grew up in Texas, and the most snow I've ever seen is like you know a half inch one winter ten years ago. Um, how is a snowblower creating like not creating a bank? And this is probably just me not understanding the technology. So feel free to. No, no, that's a great question. So rather than like the typical residential snowblower where you're kind of pushing it and it's, and it's going up, right? This has quite a bit more power. So you could literally launch the snow, you know, 30, 40 feet up in the air, right? Uh, depending on the size of the tractor that you had. So by it, putting it so far back initially, and then eventually being able to load the snow on top and on top, you never really ran out of room. It's, it's dispersing it. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Cool. Yeah, and these are these are big agricultural tractors. These aren't just like a little tractor you get down at Home Depot or Lowe's. These are these are good size, uh, almost a cab of a backhoe to put it in perspective. If no one's seen these things, they're they're good size machines, um, and they've got a like a lot of horsepower off the back end. Um, so, talking about the, the the benefits there and the differentiation of that equipment, Dylan. Uh, one of the things I found interesting is it actually looked like, if I had done my research right, that you actually GPS enabled the tractor. Um, but the take on it is a lot of us in the snow removal, including myself, had GPS and all our trucks and salters and loaders. Um, <laughs> but did you actually open up the GPS to your client base? 
Yeah, that's a great question. So we did, uh, not for the commercial, just we, we didn't really want to open our, ourselves up to kind of the liability potentially there. But for all of our residential customers, for sure. Um, and it was something we kind of had to look at uh, just due to the volume of requests and, and calls that would come in during a storm. We were kind of looking at any any way possible to diminish that amount of response during a snowstorm when everybody's wondering, hey, where, where are you guys or, or whatever if the snow started late at night so by opening up the gps um we we were basically able to allow them to look and see where their specific tractor was so as we were dispatching the the different tractors they were all numbered each each tractor had a number and then the route had a number as well the customers eventually started to kind of realize that okay tractor number six for example was their tractor so when they got that dispatch, hey, tractor number six is your tractor. Here is the login. Most people would save it on their phone or on the app. And they would actually log in and see that. And not everybody, but like 50 to 75% of them were actually really good at that. And, um, you know, kind of diminished the amount of calls coming into the office, which is huge during a stressful snowstorm. Yeah, and I, I can't, I, I, you know, I wish you had shared that with me in the earlier years because I tell you, I, I almost had some heart, heart attacks along the way. I mean, in Callahan's, we were plowing, uh, at our heyday, uh, when we capped it at 600 residential driveways. So you can imagine, obviously, very similar to what you were doing at Sudbury when that, if you, if you don't have that kind of volume, but you can imagine what that looks like, you know, 600 driveways are getting all done. You've got, you know, 15 or 20 vehicles or tractors going out. The call volume and especially a massive storm uh, was unbelievable. And the, the worst was ones that they, they actually, the city would shut down the main streets to just plow trucks and emergency vehicles. And you'd get so many calls, you couldn't go anywhere. You literally would get out of your driveway and there'd be half a foot of snow, but everybody wanted to know when you're going to be there. So the ability to open that up. And that was one of the things in the article um, that I really loved in snow magazine based all around Dylan's uh, outfit is how he had that transparency, the communication um, and then in addition, how some of the, he utilized the power of service autopilot to go out through his estimate process and actually communicate uh, through different mediums such as um, email and text. So kind of dialing into that, Dylan, um, now that we've kind of set our marketing play and we've kind of differentiated ourselves based on the equipment we're using and the different features of that equipment and the communication, uh, what did your estimating process look like? And I know you had a, a, an interesting approach to it, so I'll kind of let you explain it. But uh, would you kind of mind breaking that down, um, the estimating process and how you you broke down the different service offerings uh, all inside Service Autopilot? Yeah, for sure. So e even though our pricing was very, very upfront and it was visible on our website, and like I said earlier, people were calling more so to sign up due to – even the little bit more limited liability when it comes to residential snow removal, we still had to get every single person to sign off on something. So you're, you're right. Uh, essentially the, the only variable that we really needed for the driveways was driveway size. So I know some people do driveway square footage. We simplified it even more. How many cars could you squeeze into your driveway? Um, so basically anything up to six cars was our standard price a couple of years back. That was about 400, 500, or sorry, 499, 550 ish plus tax. Um, so we would actually send them a proposal, uh, in service autopilot, they kind of have this unique installment amount, um, field that you can pull from. So we were able to offer them kind of the seasonal rate with the discount, but then also have a secondary um, kind of uh, merge field at the bottom that said, if you were looking to break this into um, six installments, we also have that option and we would give them the installment amount. And I'd say about 25% of people would just respond back and say, okay, I'm going to sign it, but let's proceed with option two, which was essentially the, the flat rate billing for, um, I think it was either the five or the six months of the contract. Um, we, we'd also have kind of like the templated uh, services for sidewalk shoveling and salting as well. But we were we were able to get quotes out basically within seconds while on the phone with people. We wouldn't even tell them to like get off of the phone because we'd say, hey, your quote is done and we send it over. Uh, they would basically accept it right then and there. As soon as we got the acceptance back, we'd grab their credit card. And that was essentially the extent of our estimating process. Our terms were right at the bottom um, of the estimate proposal. So there was no secondary contract that they had to sign or anything like that. And I'm sure most people know, but obviously it saves the PDF right in their file. So there was no question as to what they were actually accepting. So just as a quick recap, so you've got a couple different options, one for an installment or paid up front. 
Mm-hmm. And the process was you basically closed them over the phone. And to simplify the process, you may have checked it on Maps Pro or Pro Plus but, or Maps Plus or Smart Maps. But the idea is to even really create that speed. So very similar to what Jonathan Potoshnik of the Lawn Care Millionaire talks about. Those are your gateway services, the services you're selling over the phone and you're closing them immediately. So you took that to the next level and said, hey, how many cars can you fit in that driveway? Approximately, it's going to come out in the wash to get that process going. And then you had them actually sit on the phone while you quoted it live and you literally closed them over the phone and had them sign and accept the electronic signature inside service autopilot on their phone. So I'm assuming probably so you can handle any sales or price objections when they got to the letter of the law in the actual contract itself. Is that, is that a fair assessment of, of the process Dylan, or is there anything else we missed? No, you're hundred percent bang on. And you're right. We, we did basically pull up the street view while we were talking to them. I mean, you can't really take their word for bond about how many driveways they think they could fit. So you, you're, you're right. We would pull that up. We'd verify the driveway size. And that's really all we'd have to enter into the estimate. The pricing would come in based on our price matrix. And, and you're right. We would answer any objections right then and there. Okay. Because that, that seems to be a big, big concern with a lot of people, especially in the service autopilot ecosystem is how do I go out and actually get these estimates out that quickly? Usually it's I got to go bebop around town when I'm done doing my my aeration and overseeding and my fall cleanups. And now I've got to spend the next three hours driving around haphazardly looking at all these driveways. So what you've done is created this on-demand uh, buying process well before it was really a thing in the service industry. So that's really interesting. I think one of the keys to success by watching you uh, from afar is the ability to have people buy immediately um, you know, over the phone or through the website through those processes and service autopilot. So now we're all accustomed to the Amazon, the Netflix, the Uber, the DoorDash, like people want it when they want it and they want to check it off their list. So well before that major shift in buying habits, you know, Dylan's out here hitting this Cody, you know, probably three, four years before that. So that was pretty interesting, especially in that Snow Magazine article. If you check out the link, it kind of breaks down in in even greater detail, step-by-step how he did that. Um, So Dylan, as we've kind of now defined the process, uh, you've got several hundred plowing accounts what did that look like in your business um, to actually go out and renew those contracts? So I know at Callahan's before we put a system to it, that would be almost a two to two and a half month process to actually go out to 600 clients. Um, the first couple of rounds was pretty easy, but then we were literally having to get on the phone and chase these folks. And then anybody who didn't sign back up, we were trying to go back out and fill those gaps. So I'm kind of curious how you tackle, tackle that in Maxim Lawn Care. It, it was there any tips you could share with us for anybody watching right now going out to renew their snow removal contracts, whether it's a smaller company, maybe doing 70 or 80 driveways or a company doing upwards of a thousand. I mean, um, I'm assuming these tactics will work at scale depending where you're at. Yeah, for sure. So, so we actually tried to, we were one of the first ones in our area to actually try to auto renew, uh, very, very common in the South, but in the, the Northern markets, really no one auto renews. You essentially lose all your customers and then you need to re-sign everybody back up every spring or every fall. So with our full year um, customers, we, we really tried to cement in, in their minds that you're signing up, you can cancel at any time, but this is an, an auto renewing service. Uh, how everybody still needs kind of a reminder though, especially if they're not a full year customer that you, know, you still have service with us and, and we are coming back. So we kind of uh, altered a couple automations that we had just to remind them. So at the end of their season, we would kind of remind them, you know, thank you for being such a great customer. Uh, Just just a reminder that your services do auto renew will be by, uh, I think it was roughly October 1st to stake out your driveway again. And if you prepaid, we'll take your prepayment at the same time as you did last year. If you paid monthly, your monthly payments will start at the same time. Um, But then we would always hit them with another automatic email. So everybody who had the, the tractor snow blowing, uh, in our service autopilot would essentially get um, another email, usually about September, uh, just reminding them that, you know, we're going to come and stake out your driveway and all those other things again. So most people were kind of regimented to that process. You'd get a small influx of people that, you know, obviously wanted to cancel. You can't please everybody. Um, and then other people that wanted to change their service or had moved that just hadn't informed you, but this email reminded them. And we were pretty much able to by September have a fairly accurate count of who was actually renewing, right? The, the amount of people that were basically confirmed again, we had a valid credit card on file. We hadn't heard anything back from them. And we almost used that, that email and then the staking of their driveway 
as a way to, as a secondary reminder to weed out the people that potentially didn't want us. Uh, we'd bill one month in advance for all of our monthly customers as well, so that there was no chance that we were showing up. Um, even though it was an auto renewing service, there was no chance that we were showing up come November 1st and then trying to charge their card and it was declining and they never got back to us about wanting the service. So we tried to reduce the risk of accounts receivable and, and cancels by addressing it months, months in advance. Dylan, sort of a theme that I've heard in kind of all three of the things that we've talked about is really taking a big load off of the office staff mm -hmm. by, by trying to set up processes that help customers serve themselves, make things easier for them. Was that, was like the office's throughput like a big bottleneck for you or were you just like focused on streamlining everything and it just so happens that we're talking about the few things that impacted the office? No, that was a, a huge point of like a reason why we made that decision. By the end of it, we, we had basically about a thousand driveways that we were doing and that becomes like a pretty momentous task to, to renew all those people. Especially when the conversation for 80, 90% of them is, yep, sign me back up. You still have my credit card, right? Charge it. They just want the service, right? So it's, it's kind of a little bit foreign that everybody still has this, these old tactics regimented that you need to send them a fresh estimate. You need to do all these things, right? Mm -hmm. So we really just thought that was a little bit crazy, to be perfectly honest. And, and we really tried to cement in our market that if you, if you want us, we're going to continue to come. If you don't want us, we'll, we'll cancel. And that did lighten the load, obviously, very substantially on the office. Yeah. If any of my older office employees are, are ever listening to this, they'll probably laugh because we definitely filled up all their time with new sales. And, and that was kind of what we wanted, right, to be able to focus yeah. on new sales and um, continue to grow the business that way rather than spend months and months on renewals. Awesome. So I know I'm, I'm just taking a look at a couple of notes here on the other screen that I had. And, and basically, you know, you went in and you incre increased the efficiency with the machines. Uh, you started selling early. Um, one thing we didn't touch on um, that I'm assuming is did you use uh, any of the database or anything inside Service Autopilot far as um, automations or even a manual process to go in and say, hey, it looks like you've got either regular lawn mowing or the automated uh, lawn mower bot. Uh, service, but you don't have snow removal. Was there any segmentation of the database to actually upsell that service to kind of create a year round client? Yeah. So as you mentioned, a little bit of shameless self-promotion for simple growth. I was the uh, first automations client, I believe that they got transferred over to service autopilot when they first had their automation. So that made it very, very simple to segment based on who actually had the service, who potentially had canceled the service. Um, who had gotten a, a quote for that service before. So we can kind of start to have those different conversations. Mm -hmm. But for sure, we basically segmented it into a couple emails. We weren't necessarily bombarding them, uh, but we made it very, very simple for them to respond to those emails and not necessarily sign up, but request the quote or, or book a call to speak to us. And uh, I forget the exact subject line of it, but... Um, there, there was one that we, we used uh, kind of an odd subject line for the very, very last email that almost made it seem as though like um, I, I should have pulled it up, but it was essentially like there was a mistake or something. And the open rate on that last email was just absolutely insane. But the mistake, the, the play on it was that they made a mistake for not hiring us. But the subject line almost grabbed everybody. I'll have to pull that up and maybe put that in the notes. But uh, we did use a segment of a, of a couple emails to at least nurture those people. But then we were also targeting those neighborhoods with with postcards. And uh, another thing that I wasn't sure we were going to touch on that I, I definitely want to mention is uh, a relatively low cost option for the marketing was actually our driveway markers as well. So every single one of our tractors was orange um, and every single one of our, our driveway markers was orange as well. So they're essentially about three inches wide by about six feet wide. And when they're new to your market, they look really obscure and, and kind of ugly, but eventually everybody kind of got over that. Uh, essentially, you'd put two on each side or one on each side of the driveway to mark your driveway. And yes, it helped you uh, find the driveway in the middle of the night. So you weren't GPSing every house when you can't really see the house numbers. Six foot tall. You're not missing those bad boys. <laughs> <laughs> by the end of the by the end of the season, sometimes they, they were hidden. Um, but essentially that was also a really, really key marketing thing, right? So they've gotten a couple of these postcards. They've probably gotten some of these emails. Um, 
And then they start driving home down their street and they see six driveways in a row with these markers, right? And this is in like early October. So every day they're driving past these markers and it kind of starts to regiment that oh, almost every single person on my street has these guys. So then they look at the website and then they maybe get hit with another email or another postcard. And it just starts to kind of drive everything home as like a full bodied approach. Weird, Cody. Are, are you seeing any similarities well before Jonathan Potoshnik's talk at SA5 of dominate your market? Uh, Dylan has single-handedly, I think, taken at least six of the seven things that Jonathan broke down in about 45 minutes to literally dominate your market. Um, so he literally went out through the Facebook ads and Google and casted the digital net. He went to offline marketing to build route density through door hangers, um, branding through the tractors that were all orange and the, the, the plow stakes. So when Jonathan tells about his his business, City Turf, the lawn care company, one of the things that he scaled to 10 million and beyond uh, an annual revenue residential only was that the City Turf yellow trucks would literally just be dominating these. They, just, they would consistently see them in the neighborhoods. And that's all they saw. Very similar. If you've got a thousand driveways and you've got these tractors, I'm seeing they just saw maximum lawn care orange in their sleep. These things are just pumping through, reinforcing it. And then you're hitting it with emails and postcards and everything in between. So it's really interesting that if you're going to compare the two businesses, I think there's some key factors. If you're watching this, just starting out in snow removal or really looking to go out and grow that business is it, it isn't just one secret uh, si si silver bullet. It's a combination of things that Dylan is, is so kindly breaking down to us, but that offline, the online to the offline marketing and then building route density through being awareness and going in and doing that. And then taking the pain of actually signing up in the estimate process and expediting that. Um, and those factors, I, at least from looking at the outside is what I, I really think amongst some other things, Dylan has been the key to, to your success is a lot of other people using uh, SA and kind of following Jonathan's um, footsteps with that. I know obviously, uh, this is well before SA five, so I got to you know I got to give you credit, man, to go out and do your homework and figure out these systems and processes, whether it was through reading or you know just coming up on your own. Uh, but really, really impressive there how you how you did that. Um, and I guess as we kind of wrap this up, Cody, I don't know if you have any other questions, but uh, I, I guess Dylan would be is my question would be, um, what would be what you know now if you knew it earlier when you first started snow removal? What would be the one or two takeaways? Um, in, in, in hindsight, like if you knew this when you first started, how would you have changed or what would you have done to pivot? Uh, that's a great question. So the, the first thing that kind of comes to mind is, is just being more selective. Uh, when you're like first starting to grow and you're, you're actually getting some traction, it's, it's definitely hard to say no to those things. So if I was to relaunch uh, my business, I definitely wouldn't do like residential plowing and, and all these other things and, and even commercial plowing, even though it, it definitely uh, brings in some nice sales, the level of uh, service that is required there compared to these driveways is, is a complete, basically a completely different business model. Um, so, so that I would say would probably be, be the main thing and just really focusing in on this one service um, that was really the key. Like it was more than the 80, 20 principle. It was like the 95, five principle. If we would have just focused on this from day one, um, we would have got a lot farther and, and had way, way less headaches. The, the only other thing I want to touch on is, is kind of honing in on that a little bit more. We would take rental properties. We would take other little, um, odd properties like that. And that actually ended up kind of hurting us in a sense where, and so, like you said, the, the influx of, of responses on a big storm can be massive. Well, it's even more massive when you're dealing with rental properties that have like six tenants that could be kind of trying to contact you, right? So not all thousand of those driveways were rental properties, but even if two, 300 of them, that could be 1800 people right there that are potentially wondering where these guys are. And, and they don't know the, the ins and outs of the contract their landlord signed either. Um, so it definitely causes some issues there we would have just stuck to cookie cutter, nice neighborhoods with accessible driveways and the tractor snow blowing. And I think um, we would have had a lot more of an efficient of a business. And, and that's interesting that you mentioned that. So standardizing the actual type of property that you're servicing. So if we're talking snow removal right now, uh, there was a area at Callahan's as well. So we had unbelievable route density, but it was an older neighborhood. And we had originally started where literally it had to be a square driveway and the idea was 12 to 1300 square feet. 
but we had such great density with the lawn care in this area. And there were really older homes that we thought, well, this would just make sense. These are going to be low hanging fruit. But what we found is when we got out of our perfect product fit, just like you're mentioning, Dylan, some of these driveways sweeped around the side of the house. They were up against the house. They had the drive, the, the house, and then the driveway, or the garage was off like kitty corner on a 45. So we didn't ever really have issues of plows rubbing up against the sides of houses, hitting garage doors, things like that. And when we got away from the standardization of what we were good at, what the equipment was set up for, uh, we had the same issues. I mean, we had one truck that was buried behind a house literally for like seven or eight hours in a storm of like over a foot of snow. But it was because we got out of what we were good at. And we kind of got greedy and thinking like, well, if we if we stretch this out a little bit, we can even get more work. So I think that's a big takeaway, not only for snow removal, for lawn care and home cleaning as well, uh, but particularly for snow removal. If your equipment is not set up for it and you haven't standardized it, um, that's a big issue. And, and I guess it, we didn't really talk about this beforehand, Dylan, but um, based on the standardization of your equipment and standardization, particularly uh, if you're to do it again, of the actual driveways, um, did that lead to any, uh, I guess, benefits in your training as far as being able to standardize the training as well. And, and what did that look like? Because, you know, with snow removal, with plowing, occasionally you'll see some guys or girls get um, like real dry soil or maybe some loose gravel and at least be able to manipulate what that looks like because you can't train until it snows. And when it snows, you got to be out there. So was there the ability um, to at least train folks on those tractors before you had a snowfall and in, in, in since you've trained folks on the tractor versus the plow, what's the difference? I obviously don't know, but I mean, I'm assuming there's got to be a bit of a different learning curve or, or is it the same? No, definitely a different learning curve. Uh, and the other thing I didn't mention was every single one of our tractors is hydrostatic. So there was no gears to shift, um, anything like that that you'd see on larger tractors. Basically, if you could drive like a go-kart, you could probably drive one of these tractors in a couple minutes. Now, you're not going to be perfect doing 20, 30, 40 driveways an hour, uh, but you're going to be able to go out there and actually do it. So that definitely shortened our, our learning curve and, and our training um, down quite substantially, uh, definitely compared to a, a plow truck where you, you definitely need to be more careful. And there's so many more factors than simply just back in, drop it, turn on the PTO and, and drive out. Um, so we were able to basically train someone up to be functional on a driveway, not super efficient. I'd say within like 20 to 30 minutes. Uh, but for them to become an expert, obviously, there was uh, a couple week learning curve. So we would always try to uh, get those people out quite early uh, during the storms. But honestly, I'm sure you've experienced this too. No matter what amount of training it seemed like we did before the, the season began, the uh the first storm is always uh, interesting to say the least and i kind of got first-hand action with that again actually helping the company that had bought me out um last year during the first storm of the season so it was a pretty interesting perspective <laughs> Whew, just just talking about this i got the snow anxiety uh, <laughs> kicking in already so i uh, if you've never plowed snow or run a business um you know you don't know what snow anxiety is but anybody who's watching this knows if you i don't care how big the business is how removed you are. If you've sold your business, I will tell you, uh, even after going on two years now with Callahan's be, uh, being acquired, I still wake up in the middle of the night when I see snow and I get the, I get the snow anxiety. I'm, I'm like a little kid licking the window, like, Oh, it's snowing. Uh, what's going on out there? So it, it's interesting that, uh, you know, there's such commonalities no matter where in the market. Um, but as we're, we're talking about that equipment and that train deal, and I, I also, I guess, uh, naively want to know, cause a lot of people are intrigued to buy the equipment setup. Uh, what's it look like far as visibility? So not being a tall guy myself, sometimes I'd have to get the old, uh, phone book out of the old, uh, you know, out of the house and be able to put it underneath you so I can see over the back of the truck and <laughs> when I'm backing up. So what's that look like? Are those seats adjustable? Is it, I'm assuming it's almost a glass cab 360. So are you, are you having better visibility? Is it just, is it safer? Is it easier to manipulate, um, uh, around those driveways? Yeah, it's great visibility compared to a truck for sure. And the other thing that people don't realize about the tractors is most time you think of a tractor, you think it has like the the, the uh, plow attachment in the front and like maybe something in the back. Well, all we had on the front was basically, I think it's about eight suitcase weights and they're right down near the tires. So you had literally full visibility out in front of you. There was no bucket, anything like that. So the maneuverability and the visibility was completely night and day compared to 
uh, compared to a plow truck for sure. The other thing too is you back in with these blowers because they're inverted. So you, you back into the garage and then you drive forward. Uh, so you're never backing out onto a road like you would with a plow truck, which is very, very common. You're always driving forward out onto the road, which definitely helps quite a bit. Um, you know, inevitably you're going to be doing some plowing during the day um, on a busy road and backing up, you know, you could be stuck in a driveway for easily 20 minutes, but if you can pull out quickly, uh, you're able to actually kind of squeeze out, do it, and then maybe back in if you need to do another pass. So there, there's so many benefits uh, if anybody is looking to, to actually implement this. Um, I definitely, definitely recommend it. Awesome. Cody, any closing thoughts here or questions for Dylan? Um, I know it's a, it's a little bit outside of your realm with snow, and probably the most snow and ice you've seen is probably in a snow cone, but uh, it... it <laughs> It, it, we, we've definitely seen enough of, uh, you know, the, the uh, service autopilot ecosystem in this in industry and it, and it continues to grow. Um, I remember my talk in front of four or 500 people at uh, ASCA um, last year in Pittsburgh in, in the top 100 there for the snow contractors. Um, that industry and the technology and everything that's going on continues to evolve. Um, and I know a lot of people that work with Simple Growth as a certified advisor um, recently, like right now, the big push is I need to get these estimates set up or the contracts set up for snow. So is there anything that you're seeing in the, on the essay side of things that uh, would be applicable to Dylan or just thoughts or comments before we uh, wrap it up here in a bit? Yeah, actually, I had one more question for Dylan as someone who clearly has like really wrapped their brain around marketing for service businesses what do you recommend other business owners read or watch? Like, is there something that like really sticks out as like a turning point for how you thought about marketing? Uh, that is a great question. So honestly, not so much um, like books per se with regards to my spe specific snow removal or, or marketing strategy for that. But the one thing that, that kind of comes to mind is like, there's people doing this, whether it's snow removal or something else, there's someone that's doing it that's doing a really, really good job at it. So mm -hmm. you don't need to completely reinvent the wheel. Um, and, and, you know, being a first mover in a market is great, but sometimes being a second or a 10th mover is, is actually even better. You can take like the best parts of each one of these businesses and implement them right from the get go rather than making all of these mistakes. So whether it comes to marketing or the actual business process, um, there's people out there in like Ottawa and Montreal specifically and, and lots of places all throughout Ontario uh, doing this and doing this amazingly well. So you can definitely replicate those models and marketing models to, to have success right out of the gate. Awesome. Awesome feedback. As I know a lot, a lot of people in the States right now are looking at this and trying to figure it out. Uh, there's one guy locally that I think he's got one tractor. He's kind of got it dialed in, but I don't think the ability to scale that has really been done at least in, um, in my market. And we're right now we're the third, uh, Rochester, New York actually is the third largest snowfall market in the whole United States. So if it hasn't really been adopted here, I think that at least in the States, this is, uh, kind of the next shift of snow removal. And one thing you didn't hit on Dylan that I, I, I always felt that was an issue, at least in our market is was the turf damage significantly less with these snow blowers? Cause I know sometimes in a rough winter, we would be literally spending thousands and thousands of dollars just in, in materials, not even including the labor to fix these lawns we destroyed. Yeah, that was uh, definitely something we had plastered all over our marketing materials as well. Um, just to kind of put some, some scarcity into to people's minds, maybe not scarcity is the correct word, but people, even though it might not be a hundred percent true, they associate plows with potentially after you implement these, these tractors with special cutting edges, People associate these uh, plows with damaging driveways, whether it's asphalt or interlock uh, versus these tractors that have kind of um, special UHMW kind of hardened plastic blades that won't scratch the interlock. So as soon as you kind of start cementing that in people's minds that, hey, we're not going to damage the driveway and there's no need to drive on your lawn like a plow where you actually do need to push the snow considerably far back um they instantly start thinking about this is the only reasonable option to do it as long as the price is is valid and then when they see the price and the amount of service that they can get because you're so much more efficient it, it almost sells itself so that's awesome awesome well dylan appreciate you, you dropping some knowledge on us here um 
obviously, uh, Cody, thanks for joining us as well today. Uh, SA Weekly here coming up. Uh, we've got a uh, special guest, uh, hopefully going to be announcing later uh, next week, um, headliner, and then the following week we're going to be diving into accounting and um, financial numbers as well. So kind of rounding it out. If you have any suggestions, if you're watching the SA Weekly Talk Show on Facebook Live or the podcast, uh, feel free to drop us a note of any suggestions um, that you're doing. And as well, uh, don't forget, if you are part of the SA ecosystem, we've got uh, SA Thrive, the basically on-demand digital um, conference, basically, that is going to be going live, I believe, November, uh, is it 10th and 11th, Cody? I believe you are correct. I don't have the date. I, I believe it is, but right at the beginning of November, as always, uh, obviously, this would have been SA7, but uh, some individuals like myself are, are some longtime goers haven't missed one. So I think SA probably made a decision that uh, this would be SA Thrive. So hopefully if COVID is uh, dying down and, and we're back in shape next year, we can have SA7 proper and uh, yeah. we can get the pin that we've been to all seven. So yeah, uh, we are officially saying that SA7 is delayed to next year. And this is kind of a, a whole separate event. But honestly, it's going to be just as good as as a normal conference except you don't have to buy a plane ticket you don't need a hotel room you can i mean if you want to travel somewhere you can because uh it'll all be online you can watch it from uh, acapulco if you want so love it but absolutely excited marcus sheridan going to be the uh, keynote speaker martha woodward one of the certified advisors uh going to be doing one of the headline talks myself as well uh represent simple growth I'm uh, going to have Jonathan Toshnik, a whole bunch of the service autopilot team is going to be out talking as well, among some other probably late arrivals that are, be, are soon to be announced. So if you haven't checked it out, the early bird pricing is still uh, in effect. So that can be found on the service autopilot website as well. So we will see you again next week. SA Weekly Talk Show, 1 p.m. Eastern, 12 p.m. Central. Dylan, Cody, thanks once again, and we'll see you guys next week. See ya. See ya. If you like this show, you might want to check out our resources at www.startsimplegrowth.com. While you're there, enter to win an estimator chatbot. Mike Callahan is available for private coaching.